Roy Olmsted uh, started out as a Seattle police officer. Uh, I think he joined the force in 1907. He was smart, ambitious, clever, and so he rose through the ranks pretty quickly. Roy Olmsted captured Brad Holden's interest as he was researching for his book, Seattle Prohibition, Bootleggers, Rum Runners, and Graft in the Queen City. A Seattle police officer on track for success, Roy Olmsted ran into a problem once prohibition began, money. Police officers weren't making a lot of money. Their salaries weren't very high, so a lot of them had uh, side hustles as a way to generate extra income. Some of those side hustles were on the legal side of things, some of them not so much. Olmsted opted for the illegal side of things, going from a part-time gig to eventually his own bootlegging operation. And he said to himself, you know what? There's one thing I'm really good at. I'm a damn good bootlegger. So that's what he decided to do. So he jump, just jumped into that full throttle. Quickly, Olmsted became Western Washington's top liquor boss, smuggling booze into Seattle speakeasies. He was the king of the Puget Sound bootleggers, as they called him. Now, this guy wasn't violent, though. He was known as a gentleman bootlegger whose men never carried guns. And he was always ready with a smile when he met the adoring public on the street. He was almost a folk hero to a lot of people. Uh, he didn't engage in other things like prostitution or gambling or drugs. He just stuck to smuggling top quality booze from Canada down here to Seattle. So people knew they were getting safe quality booze not tainted by criminal activity. In fact, at one point, he was the region's largest employer. Eat your heart out, Amazon. But much like Amazon, Roy had his eggs in a few different baskets. He and his wife Elise ran a radio station out of their Mount Baker mansion. His wife uh, did nursery rhymes, so she had a popular program at night called the Aunt Vivian Show where she could read nursery rhymes to the local children who were tuning in. And there was a lot of rumors at the time that she was inserting coded messages to assist Olmsted's bootlegging operation. All good things must come to an end, though. The feds eventually caught up with him, and he spent four years in McNeil Island Penitentiary. And by the time he died in the 1960s, he was mostly forgotten about. In fact, his story hasn't really been, didn't really kind of get rediscovered until about 15 or 20 years ago. Well, we're glad it did. Here's to you, Roy Olmsted, the king of the Puget Sound bootleggers. Oh.